Humans have always been fascinated by the stories hiding within the past. The chance of finding a shard of pottery or a fragment of bone that could shed light on what life was like hundreds or even thousands of years ago feels many archaeologists, as well as amateur explorers. These people spend years of their lives hunting for answers. Neolithic skull found by mudlarks. The muddy banks of the Thames have long provided us with clues as to what life was like hundreds of years ago, as ancient artifacts and fragments from the civilization that lived along those banks frequently wash up with the tides. This happens so often, in fact, that an entire subculture has grown up around searching for these clues. Mudlarks are amateur archaeologists who, after obtaining a permit from the Port of London flock to the banks of the Thames during low tide to collect any fascinating objects that might have been uncovered by the receding water. They're responsible for several artifacts currently on display in the Museum of London and recently added another impressive find to their repertoire. After uncovering the fragments of a human skull while searching the banks, alarmed mudlarks immediately alerted the local police who then launched a full-scale crime scene investigation of the rest of the banks. The fragment was carbon dated, and it was discovered the skull was likely not a player in an active homicide case, as it dated back to the Neolithic era. After analysis, the skull appeared to come from a male over the age of 18 who lived 5,600 years ago. This makes it one of the oldest human remains found in the Thames. Mudlarks continued their search, but were unsuccessful in locating any more of the skull. Unsurprisingly, as his body has been at the mercy of the water for almost six millennia, the man lived around 3600 BC during the New Stone Age. This began about 6,000 years ago with the development of farming, and it ended as Britain moved into the Bronze Age around 2000 BC. During this time, the area around London was covered in extensive woodlands. There wasn't any permanent settlements although there was some evidence of farmsteads likely making the Neolithic man a farmer in the region. However, this wasn't farming as we understand it today. Based off of flint tools and pottery found in the area, archaeologists speculate their lifestyle consisted of semi-nomadic herding, supplemented by more settled agriculture. The Thames was a vital resource for these people, who relied on it for water and fertilization of the land. There's even evidence that these early people worshipped the Thames as sacred and sent rare and beautiful weapons and pottery as offerings to the river. Although we'll never know if this man was one of these offerings or if his body ended up in the water as a result of the changing course of the Thames, he serves as an important point of study for researchers trying to learn more about the presence of early humans in the area. Fungus destroying a buried Viking ship near Holden. In late 2018, Archaeologists using radar to search a well-known Viking archaeological site near Holden in southeastern Norway discovered a buried Viking ship. This was named the Gelstad ship after the area it was found. It was resting underground in a Viking cemetery where it had been ritually buried according to ancient custom and measured 20 meters long. Viking ships are archaeological treasure troves of information for historians but the team was initially hesitant to excavate this ship due to the damage that open air can have on wet, rotting wood. Unfortunately, earlier this year they made a discovery that forced their hand. Further analysis reveals that what remains of the ship is covered in a fungus that's slowly devouring the wood. This makes it a race against time to save this priceless time capsule before it's lost to decay. The ship is already extremely decomposed due to the length of time that it's been at the mercy of this damp soil. The solid wood keel and iron nails are all that remain, but the fungus covering the keel has caused it to become extremely brittle. The excavation process that archaeologists must now use is painstaking, but it is vital if this valuable piece of heritage and history is to be saved. First, they must carefully strip the topsoil, processing what they remove for a sieve, and search for artifacts that might have been tilled up by farmers over the centuries. Then they'll construct a weatherproof tent over the site for protection. As they begin to remove the soil around and inside of the ship, each layer of wood will be 3D scanned as it's exposed, along with any imprints in the surrounding dirt for later analysis of what the missing parts of the ship may have looked like. The wooden remains that are uncovered will have to be kept damp and preserved to keep the already rotting wood from crumbling further. 
Any organic material around the decomposed wood will also be analyzed to provide archaeologists with valuable information about what might have been buried in the Viking cemetery around the large ship. If the operation is successful, it will be the first Viking ship to be excavated in Norway in 115 years. Viking ships like this one were built for traveling long distances in the turbulent sea between the end of the 8th century and the beginning of the 10th century. This specific ship was likely made to both row and sail, although archaeologists are unsure whether this ship included a mast, and won't be sure until the excavations have progressed further and they can carefully analyze the 3D scans. It's vital to attempt to save as much of this ship as possible, so valuable information about Viking culture that lies covered in thousands of years of dirt and rock can finally be brought to light. Ancient human hybrid before humans existed as the Homo sapiens of today, several distinct and primitive species roamed the earth, mixing their genomes over tens of thousands of years until the genotype of current Homo sapiens established. The Denisova cave in Siberia was home to two of these groups of early hominins, the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Although encounters between these two groups was likely not uncommon, as nearly all Denisovan bone fragments from the area contained traces of Neanderthal DNA, the two populations remained genetically distinct for thousands of years. This was due to the group's sparse populations over a large geographic area. A first-generation offspring from these two groups was never found. Until 2018, when archaeologists analyzed specimens from the cave, discovered the finger bone fragment of a female who lived over 90,000 years ago. She had a genome indicating that her mother was a Neanderthal and her father was a Denisovan. The individual, nicknamed Denny, astonished researchers. Previously, the closest example of ancient human species interbreeding was a Homo sapiens with Neanderthal ancestor within four to six generations. A first-generation person of this ancient mixed ancestry was totally unheard of and almost unimaginable. Scientists initially sequenced the mitochondrial DNA. This is inherited solely from the mother and is distinct from the main genome, and identified Denny's mother as a Neanderthal. Interestingly, her mother was more closely related to a Neanderthal in Croatia than in the ones of the region. Researchers quickly realized they didn't have the full picture. As they began sequencing her genome and comparing it to the sequences from Neanderthal and Denisovan fragments around the region, around 40% of the sequence matched the Neanderthal DNA as expected. However, they were surprised to discover that another 40% matched the Denisovan DNA. Since there was roughly equal amounts of each, it indicated that Denny had one parent from each group. Further gene analysis confirmed these findings. Denny was the first-generation offspring of two distinct human species. She's also the only one of this kind that's ever been found. Denny will now play a key role in research of early human species. Scientists continue to attempt to piece together how so many human species evolved into the Homo sapiens of today. They will look at her example as they attempt to answer questions such as why did the species gene pool remain distinct for thousands of years if they were known to frequently mix? Were these hybrid offspring infertile, as can happen when crossing different species? Although these questions elude us now, Denny is undoubtedly a stepping stone to greater understandings of our own species. The further we look into the past, the harder it is to find the remnants of lives lived that can tell us about where we came from. And the further back we go, the smaller the artifacts that we rely on to learn about history become. Archaeologists and amateur sleuths might spend the better part of their lives searching through ancient caves and mud. This could be to only find a sliver of bone or dirt impressions left over from something long ago decayed. However, these tiny artifacts can tell researchers so much about the people they belong to. Each tiny clue functions as a valuable piece in the puzzle that attempts to answer the where did we come from. So what do you make of these interesting facts? It seems that every year a number of impossible to explain phenomena fills our skies. From sightings of supernatural phenomena to unidentified flying objects, to a number of strange sights and impossible to explain circumstances, it feels as if no story is too far-fanged. 
One interesting sky phenomena that various people from across the world have been reporting on is that of unexplained cities being seen in the sky. Going back a few days ago, video footage from the Shandong province in eastern China started to emerge. Those that saw the images said it looks like a giant city was floating in the sky. Some quickly said these were normal cloud formations, but many didn't accept this claim, saying that it's quite obvious that there's something up there even comparing it to the Hogwarts castle from Harry Potter. Others soon started to suggest that the Chinese government was testing some new technology, and that it gives off the illusion that castles and other objects are in the sky. Interestingly, the United States military has come forward and said they are experimenting with holographic lasers, and these will give the illusion that there's objects in the sky that aren't actually there. Back on the 20th of October, 2015, there appeared to be a number of sightings all across China of floating cities residing within the clouds. Videos began to surface all across the internet of the strange phenomenon, with the cities seemingly resting amongst the clouds, appearing to be massive skyscrapers floating in the distance, filled with massive constructions and lights bouncing around. When video enthusiasts attempted to explain the footage, rather than finding evidence of a hoax, they only helped to confirm the video's authenticity of which led to the sightings becoming an internet phenomenon of people attempting to understand what was witnessed. Some claim that the floating city was that of a massive alien spaceship that was floating above the Chinese territories. However, a closer examination of the footage showed that the city was far more human in its design and seemed to bear a similar resemblance to a nearby Chinese city, located where the sighting had originally taken place. This led some to claim that perhaps the sighting was that of an experimental Chinese program to allow their cities to take flight to temporarily prevent damage from earthquakes or other natural phenomena. However, the absurdity of this claim became too obvious for the theory to have held any merit. The truth was that the floating city sighting and subsequent video footage was merely that of a phantom organa, a common atmospheric illusion that causes images far from the distance to appear as if they're floating in the sky high above the horizon. The optical illusion occurs when layers of warm and cold air create an atmospheric dust that acts similar to that of a refracting lens, creating an almost mirrored image of the object past the horizon and making it appear as if it's floating amongst the clouds. Such illusions have allowed people to see images of cities far past the curve of the horizon making it appear as if boats were sailing through the air, or as if cities themselves were built amongst the clouds. Though this phenomenon has become somewhat of an explained natural illusion, such sightings never fail to baffle those witnessing it. Interestingly, there are many that reject the idea of Fata Morgana having been responsible for the Chinese floating cities, claiming that the video shows more than enough evidence of three-dimensional movement. That would not have been possible with a refracted image. As mentioned, some don't believe this is a natural phenomena and go on to suggest that the government is behind these signs and that they're using HARP technology to create these images. HARP, also known as the High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program, is a little-known yet critically important U.S. military defense program, which has generated quite a bit of controversy over the years in certain circles. Though denied by HAB officials, some researchers allege that secret capabilities of HAB are designed to afford the U.S. military's goal of achieving full-spectrum dominance. What's strange is that a few years back, amateur researchers said the United States may achieve this by the year 2020. Others have even stated that HAB can and has been used for weather modification to cause earthquakes and tsunamis. When strange shapes like this appear in the sky, people tend to say it's harp, suggesting they're possibly testing new technology. The University of Alaska Fairbanks stated the following on their website. HARP is the world's most capable high-power, high-frequency transmitter for the study of the ionosphere. The HARP program is committed to developing a world-class ionospheric research facility consisting of the following. The ionospheric research instrument, a high-power transmitter facility operating in the high-frequency range. The IRI can be used to temporarily excite a limited area of the ionosphere for scientific study. A sophisticated suite of scientific or diagnostic instruments that can be used to observe the physical processes that occur in the excited region. 
Observation of the processes resulting from the use of the IRI in a controlled manner will allow scientists to better understand processes that occur continuously under the natural stimulation of the sun." End quote. Although this sounds like science fiction, humans are able to modify the weather and interestingly, this has been happening since the 1940s. Scientists have said they can use clouds to rain on certain areas that are lacking water. It's due to this that people have suggested the government could be behind these strange cloud formations. However, some have said it looks to be more natural in origin, and have said that clouds come in many different shapes and sizes. For example, they say that some people confuse lenticular clouds with UFOs. These clouds are a distinctive cloud formation, and have been regularly confused for UFOs throughout history due to their smooth round or oval shape. The clouds are not uncommon, but are most regularly found in mountainous areas and can appear singular or stats like pancakes. Interestingly, sky anomalies aren't anything new. For the last few decades, people have been coming forward with their encounters and stating that unnatural objects appear in the sky and that the majority of these can't be explained. Theorists have suggested that the majority of these strange anomalies are actually created by secret programs and that when people cite these objects, it's usually when tests are being carried out. Government officials have denied this, though, and say that no stranger or out there tests are being carried out by these facilities, and that they're only used to monitor the weather. So what do you guys make of these images? Do you think it shows a city in the sky? Or can this be explained as Fata Morgana? Also, what's your opinion on weather modification and the HARP program? UFO sightings are becoming increasingly common, and evidence of alien activity is constantly being leaked to the public. Governments are finding it harder to keep information regarding UFOs hidden, with no shortage of hacking attempts and ex-government officials giving up more insights. No matter what you believe when it comes to UFOs, researchers say the evidence is in favor of alien life existing. And as more people are opening up to the possibility that we're not alone in the universe, more people are starting to take an interest. In 1983, when Gary McKinnon was just 17 years old, he went to his local cinema in North London to see a new movie called War Games. In the movie, a computer genius hacks into a Pentagon network. The movie had a big impression on Gary, and it got him thinking. Maybe he could be a hacker too. Coupled with his interest in science fiction and UFOs, his passion for hacking was only ever going to lead him in one direction. Between February 2001 and March 2002, Gary McKinnon was able to hack into U.S. computer networks where he allegedly uncovered a whole host of information that would land him in deep water, facing possible extradition to the United States. If found guilty, he could have faced a 70-year prison term and up to $2 million in fines. As U.S. prosecutors pushed for his extradition, it was eventually turned down by Theresa May in 2012 justifying her decision based on human rights grounds. Teresa May defended him by saying the following, Mr. McKinnon is accused of serious crimes, but there's also no doubt that he's seriously ill. He has Asperger's syndrome and suffers from depressive illness. The legal question before me now is whether the extent of that illness is sufficient to preclude extradition. After careful consideration of all the relevant information, I have concluded that Mr. McKinnon's extradition would increase the risk of him ending his life, that a decision to extradite him would be incompatible with Mr. McKinnon's human rights. So the question is what information did he expose? McKinnon claimed he'd managed to gain access to NASA websites and in an interview with Rich Planet TV claiming to have found information relating to UFOs and extraterrestrial life, he claimed to have seen an Excel sheet which had the ranks and names of unknown people as well as other sheets which had tabs for material transfers between ships. He tried to do some research on the names of the ships, around 8 or 10 in total, but was unable to find any information relating to any of them. None of these ships were public knowledge, which led him to believe that they were either secret projects or part of a non-terrestrial U.S. initiative. McKinnon stated the following, so I took that as they probably had a secret space-based program. He also acknowledged that it was open to interpretation and that it could have been another term for astronauts. He gained access to these top-secret documents through a program called LandSearch. After obtaining control over the domain, 
He had the capability to search all the files from folders on every machine. Some have linked this discovery in the NASA livestream sightings. NASA's live streaming service gives people the option to watch important launches and missions in real time. But the service also has a reputation for broadcasting other strange phenomena. UFO researchers believe the service has been pivotal in their search for alien activity on Earth. The live streaming service has often been at the center of discussions in UFO circles. And more people are now using these live cams to try and identify anything unusual. A strange object was seen hovering close to the ISS in July 2020. The donut-shaped UFO suddenly appeared during a live feed of the International Space Station, which caused the NASA live stream to go offline. Theorists believe it was NASA that took the service offline, as it coincided with the same time the initial sighting was made. The footage went viral, and UFO enthusiasts claimed it was proof that the space agency knew what they were seeing. Notable UFO hunter Scott C. Waring said the following, While watching the ISS I noticed that a small glowing light was noticeable in the distance. This was over two radar dishes. However, due to it being hard to see, I assumed it wasn't worth reporting. But as I went further into the footage, I noticed that NASA went to a blue screen. This can often happen when changing cameras. As they went to a new camera, you can clearly see the space station putting the UFO in the center of the screen and enlarging it to maximum size. Though UFO enthusiasts have speculated such sightings to be of alien origin, scientists in the past have given much simpler scientific explanations for the sightings that have been reported on the live streams. According to former NASA engineer James Ulberg, most UFO sightings are nothing more than space dandruff, and these can be seen floating in front of the cameras. This downdraft is often attributed to things like flakes of ice or debris. The realization of what's been seen in many videos is nothing beyond the norm. James Olberg also defended his position, claiming that it's natural for the human brain to try and make sense out of these small objects. Despite Olberg's defense, analysis on the objects from researchers in the field of UFOs claim that the behavior of these objects doesn't imply that they're debris of any kind. The movements of some of these objects seem to be completely unnatural, making sharp and sudden movements. Other objects in space have more recently been filmed, including during the SpaceX Dragon launch, which carried astronauts to the International Space Station. While the video was being live-streamed from the rocket itself, various bizarre and strange objects were seen hovering above Earth. In another clip, a strange UFO was seen leaving Earth and moving deeper into space before disappearing. One viewer claimed the following. After the launch of SpaceX's Falcon 9 crew demo, an object from Earth to space can be seen around the 14-minute mark. Is this a UFO, a piece of space junk, or a piece of the rock end? Others were reacting on social media during the live launch. Some viewers think they observed some UFOs at various points on the live feed, with many people sharing the clip of the event on Twitter with their opinion. Many UFO enthusiasts commented on this stream. A range of comments were about the flashing lights that could be seen, and many people stating they saw multiple UFOs moving intensely and rapidly, which could not have resembled debris. While space junk seems the more plausible cause, something else could also be at work. Various other UFOs have allegedly been seen close to our sun, causing UFO enthusiasts to suggest that these crafts are interested in our sun, and that it may even fuel their shims. The reason they say this is because so many UFOs have been captured close to the sun. NASA have said, however, that these can be explained, and what people are seeing is just camera anomalies. So what do you make of these unexplained UFO secrets? And what do you think Gary saw on those computers? These three stories of interesting and significant discoveries found by everyday people will have you starting to pay just a little more attention to your surroundings and what potential valuables could be hiding around you at any time. Anthony Doolin finds goldmine homeowner Anthony Doolin had already owned his property for over three years when it offered him the surprise of a lifetime. He'd purchased the home in Australia for $1.35 million but he didn't know that it was secretly worth a lot more until he discovered a gold mine in his back garden. The property included 16.5 hectares of land, 
so it's not unusual it would take so long to fully explore the area. When he finally stumbled into the mine, it felt like a movie moment. In describing his experience shortly after the find, Doolin stated, I nearly fell over. I just couldn't believe it. There was a lot of mining at the turn of the century, and in those hills there are quite the few little mines. It's about six meters and still intact. As he stated, the mine uncovered by Doolin was not the only mine on the property. But for some inexplicable reason, Doolin didn't further explore the mines. Shortly after the discovery, despite his continued lack of investigation into the mines, his mother Jane sold the property on his behalf. While the pair asked for $1.65 no one seemed willing to cough up the price. Ultimately, Doolin settled for the same price he'd initially paid for the property. Hopefully the new owners were able to find some more surprises of their own. The Thornberry hoard for Ken Allen. A little digging was all it took for him to come into a considerable amount of wealth. This wealth came from what is now known as the Thornberry hoard. Hoard referring to a secret stock of valuables. Allen discovered the Thornberry hoard in March 2004 while living in Thornberry in England. He was digging a pond in his back garden. The surface of a grainy, decorated, grayware pot came into his view. Inside the pot, which measured 16 to 20 inches in height, were 11,600 copper alloy Roman coins. This hall is thought to be the third largest of its kind found in Great Britain. Allen quickly reported his find, taking the valuables to the Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery. There, the treasure was weighed at 63 pounds. It took multiple people to lift the bucket it was collected in. After drying and chemically treating them, most of the coins were easily identified. The majority of the hoard consisted of the Roman coins, radiates and numbers, specifically 11,449 of the latter and 11 of the former. Radiates are named for the depiction of the radiate crown, also known as the solar crown. This symbolizes the sun and the powers associated with it. Numbers is Latin for coin, and these coins tended to have low value at the time of their use. Coins are dated in many ways, including by observations of who is depicted on the coin and the style of the letters. Some coins are easier to date than others, especially when damage is considered. In this case, experts were largely successful in dating the hoard. They were able to date the earliest coins back to the reign in 260, the latest date back to the Constantinian dynasty in 348. Most of them, however, were from the 330s. Coins from the hoard from this era had three different reverse types, which refers to the back face of the coin. The backs were marked with the phrase Gloria Exorcitus, which means to the glory of the army. The designs were either of two soldiers or the Roman capitals. Other coins were designed to commemorate battles, which was fought between Constantine I and Licinius. The battle was ultimately won by Constantine, who became the sole emperor of Rome. These coins depict Victoria, the goddess of victory, standing on the bow of a ship, Despite the pot coming out of the ground significantly damaged, it was identified as having origin in Monmouthshire. Following the hoard's assessment by a valuation committee, it was valued at £40,000. Through funding by the Heritage Lottery Fund, the Headley Museum Treasure Acquisition Scheme and others, the Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery were able to acquire and exhibit the hoard. The value and size of the hoard is comparable to a few others such as the Never Compton board and the Bishop's Wood coins. The Nether Compton hoard consisted of 22,670 coins and was found in 1989. The Bishop's Wood hoard was found in 1895 and consisted of 17,548 coins. French couple ordered to return gold found in garden. The extreme excitement and subsequent disappointment of finding a fortune and then having to return it to somebody else is hard to imagine but for one French couple it became their reality. After discovering a cache of gold ingots in the garden of their home, the 800,000 euro value of their treasure was ordered back to the previous owners of the property. The couple bought the home in 2002, but didn't discover the gold until 2009, where they found six ingots. In 2013, 
they found another 22. The findings were accidental, and the couple was sure to legally declare their discovery to the police, the mayor's office, and the Bank of France. They ended up selling 23 of the 28 ingots. The sale of the bars ultimately caught the attention of Trackfin. A French anti-money, the agency swiftly contacted the former residents of the house and alerted them to the discovery. This included a widow and her eight children, as the father had recently passed away. The family had originally inherited the house from the father's parents. The widow is quick to sue the couple for both damages and compensation. She claimed that as the former property owners, the gold still rightfully belonged to her family. The claims of the previous owner weren't entirely baseless. She explained the gold originally belonged to the parents of her deceased husband. Her husband had only found two of the bars before they sold the house in 2002. Luckily, she was able to produce a purchase certificate proving ownership of the unrecovered gold bars. She argued the discovered bars were hers by right of succession. In defense of the couple, their lawyer stated, Everyone has told them that the ingots were theirs. In good faith, they considered themselves the owners of the gold. They were, after all, in alignment with a rule that exists in most countries, stating that any treasure of archaeological value must be reported to authorities. But since the widow was able to display sufficient proof of ownership to the gold to the court in 2015, the couple who found the treasure were court-ordered to return the money made from the sale of the 15 at gold ingots, as well as the remaining gold. Following this ruling, one of the judges explained, something hidden or buried, is necessarily aware at the moment of discovery that he is not the owner of that item. The order was confirmed by the Court of Appeals in 2017. Ultimately, this was upheld by a Supreme Court decision on June 6, 2018. If you think this decision sounds a bit unfair, you're not alone. It turns out that determining ownership for treasure found on a property is fairly complicated typically. Valuables found on a property are shared between the finder and the owner. If the finder is the owner of the property, they have claim to the whole hoard. That is, however, unless the previous owners didn't explicitly relinquish their ownership. Since the house's sellers had proof of ownership, the rule stated that treasure should be returned to the rightful owners. The situation would have been different if the coins were discovered from ancient Roman this would be opposed to any personal collection, because it would be assumed the original coin owners were long dead. This was the case of Thornberry Hoard we mentioned earlier. As the lawyer explained, here the sellers of the house were able to prove the gold belonged to them. It would have been different if my clients had discovered precious old coins, for example, as it would have been difficult to discover their first owners. That is what we would call a loss of memory ownership. Treasure ownership is even further complicated if you find it in a typical storage place, such as an attic. The previous owners can claim their ownership is assumed. Take this story as a warning to not claim any found treasure too hastily. In fact, in some countries like Australia, it's the law that you can't keep any valuables found in a property, even if you've purchased the land, without making a fair attempt to locate the original owner, or you're at risk of being charged with theft. It seems that finding treasure isn't as luxurious and glamorous as it sounds. Hopefully these stories remind you that treasure lurks around us, even in the most mundane and unexpected places. It seems that even digging around our backyard has the potential to bring unforeseeable blessings into our lives. So what do you make of these unexpected discoveries? It's said that Disneyland, Disney World, and Disney in general are the happiest places on Earth. Whether you watch Cinderella on repeat as a child, or you've been binging Disney films as an adult. Disney has had a huge impact on so many of our lives. But behind the cheery musical numbers and the smiling cast members, the Disney parks hold a much darker truth. Whether you believe these spooky tales or choose to wave them off, Disney has battled many odd rumors, some of which staff barely deny. One of the most well-known ones is that of Walt Disney's ghost. Walt Disney is a household name, and with all that work he's put into establishing Disney and bringing joy into the lives of so many children, it shouldn't come as a surprise that he wasn't willing to leave it behind when he passed away. 
Main Street in Disneyland features a firehouse with a small apartment above it. When work began on the park on July 16, 1954, Walt Disney himself requested to be put in it to give himself a space to work early mornings and late nights so that he could oversee the park. When the park opened just a year later on July 17, 1955, he began to utilize a small apartment, just 500 square feet in size. The eerie tale allegedly begins when a cast member turned off the lights within the apartment when they were closing the park up. However, when they left the building, they noticed the light was still on. Assuming she'd made a mistake, she went back up, turned off the light and left the building, only to notice the light on again. This time, the cast member ensured the lamp was physically unplugged, left the building and once again saw the light from the window. When the cast member went up yet again to turn the light off, she reportedly heard a voice, presumed to be that of Walt Disney himself, who simply said, I'm still here. As a tribute to Disney's work ethic, the light remains on in this apartment at all time, just in case his ghost is still working away, overseeing the company and watching over the park. Other cast members have mentioned hearing footsteps from that small apartment, saying that Disney seems to be putting in the long hours just as he did when he was alive. Disney passed away in 1966 of lung cancer and only ever saw the completed construction of the California park. It certainly is understandable why he would not want to leave. Now, if you visit Disneyland, you can access the apartment via a behind-the-scenes tour and see the space, or if you look up the main street, you should be able to see the lights in the window of the firehouse apartment. Another place of interest to paranormal researchers is that of the Haunted Mansion. One legend circulating Disney are the sightings of ghosts within the Haunted Mansion. Although this sounds as though the park's guests may just be very impressed by the animatronics, lights and acting, the accompanying tale and bizarre sightings indicate a genuine haunting at the mansion right. The photographer hired to capture footage and photographs of the Haunted Mansion for Disney's online content initially saw nothing unusual or out of the ordinary on the ride, with it functioning and operating smoothly, and the shoot seemingly being successful. The only ghosts he spotted were those created by Disney. It is the haunted mansion after all. When looking back at the photos taken, the wispy face of a young boy is visible from one of the doom buggies, turning backwards to face the photographer. The photographer is insistent on not having seen a boy of that age on the attraction queuing for the ride nor being around the nearby area. This seems fairly easy to dismiss so far. Shadows and odd lights here and there can be easy to make out a face when there really isn't anything there. But this strange story is only just the beginning. In 1994, a mother asked Disney if she and her family could spread the ashes of her deceased son in the haunted mansion, as it was the boy's favorite ride. While Disney did have to refuse this request, the family was granted some extra time on the ride in his memory. During the ride, however, they noticed the family throwing a powdery substance over the edge of the ride's dune buggies. The assumption was that these were the boys' ashes, and so the ride was promptly shut down and cleaned, despite the quick cleaning action. Since then, there have been some strange occurrences surrounding the haunted mansion. One guest recalled a young boy running around the mansion's ballroom, only for staff to search and find no one, though most people who've seen the child have spotted him next to the exit of the ride. Numerous park visitors have seen a crying boy, who when they approach to offer help, has seemingly disappeared. Since this is the most frequently reported instance, the legend has become known as the crying boy. Some people also believe they may have spotted this ghost on the Pirates of the Caribbean ride. Requests for ashes to be spread at Disney parks are apparently more common than you think. The last place of interest is that of the Tower of Terror. One of Disney's most iconic rides is the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, with various versions of the attraction being found across multiple Disney parks. However, the Disney's California Adventure Park's Tower of Terror was that little bit more frightening than others, before it was rebuilt as the Guardians of the Galaxy's Mission Breakout attraction. Perhaps the strange happenings were the reason behind this remodel. A clip taken in April 2014 showed mysterious footage from the ride's routine maintenance inspection. At the end of each day, the bellhops the Roll Disney cast members assume 
when working on the Tower of Terror ride the attractions themselves, ensuring everything is functioning smoothly. In the footage uploaded of one of these gems, a figure can be seen to appear and vanish multiple times from behind the employee. Further into the video, another human-like shape can be seen to sit next to an empty seat beside the employee, with the arms appearing to be folded and legs crossed over one another. Some say this figure was just a reflection of the light emitted during the ride, and others say the ghost is more likely from where other security tapes have overlapped. Plenty of people do claim they can make out distinctive features. Eyes, a face, and a clear body, which would not be possible if the shape was simply lined. Many paranormal researchers are convinced by this video. Another video taken in 2009 shows a similar ghost-like figure by the windows of the tower, where the elevator doors opened during the ride. Here, the ghost appeared to stand up before disappearing once again. The speculation as to who the ghost may be has quickly been narrowed down to a former Bell Hot cast member who passed away on shift. Some report the cause of this loss of life was from a heart attack, while others say the cause was unknown to the public. The cast member passed away on Platform D, where some mysterious events have transpired since. At the end of each day when cast members do the end of the day run, apparently it's common practice now for Platforms A, B, and C to be done separately and then they all complete Platform D together, because the ghost has been said to enjoy messing around with the employees. Though none of the actions credited to the ghost have been dangerous or caused harm, they do certainly add to the tension of the job. The pretend ghost from within the ride would be off-cue, lights would flicker, and the ride would sometimes freeze despite it running smoothly throughout the entire day. Although this former employee reserves his playful pranks to staff, Part guests certainly have had their fair share of sightings. Apparently, if you're in the boiler room of the Tower of Terror, the ghost can be seen in your peripheral vision, though the ghost disappears when you look directly at it. Are the sightings and strange experiences the result of an overactive imagination, or is the Tower of Terror home to the ghost of the bellhop cast member? Disneyland and Disney World are for some of the happiest places on Earth. Despite some of these ghost stories being based upon awful events, Disneyland seems to be keeping these fans, employees, and even Disney himself happy and entertained during the afterlife. These mysterious secrets linger around the Disney parks, but are they urban legends? Or is there something more to be discovered on your next visit to Disney? But if you think these rumors are nothing more than spooky tales to accompany the more frightening rides, or the ghosts are haunting the attractions, it would seem that Disney definitely has a darker side. So what do you make of these mysterious Disney secrets? No one really knows if there is extraterrestrial life outside of our own planet. Many believe there is something out there and experts are constantly looking for answers to prove this theory. Some people have encountered alien life on our own planet. However, many people are skeptical of their stories. While UFO sightings become increasingly common, there's also been a sharp increase in reports of USOs, unidentified submerged objects. When former United States Navy Commander David Fravor appeared as a guest star on the Joe Rogan Experience, he opened up about an encounter that a fellow pilot had while on board a submarine. At the Roosevelt's Rhodes Naval Station, Puerto Rico, there were two occasions when he claimed to have seen strange underwater objects. During the first sighting, the pilot was out recovering an unmanned drone with his team when he claimed he saw a large and circular mass below the surface. He was sure it wasn't a submarine. In his second sighting, he claimed to have seen a practice torpedo get pulled into the abyss of the ocean in the presence of a similar USO. The torpedo was never seen again. USOs are usually passed off as common objects, which are distorted below the surface, but trained Navy personnel are more familiar with the ocean. So when military officials claim to have witnessed a USO or UFO sighting, it automatically becomes more credible. Reports of USOs go back years, with some even being detected by nuclear submarines rigged with the most sensitive listening technology in the world. On the 19th of April, 1957, crew members aboard a Japanese fishing boat, Kitsukawa Maru, witnessed two metallic silvery objects descending from the sky into the ocean 
The crew estimated the size of the craft to be around 10 meters in length and without any kind of wings. In 2007, an eyewitness off the coast of Half Moon Bay, California, claimed she had observed three UFOs while traveling on the cruise ship Dawn Princess, renamed in 2017 as Pacific Explorer. The witness claimed three objects came into view, all uniform with each other, evenly spaced in a line parallel to the ship's hull and hovering just above the water's surface. Nearly spherical objects glowing in the sky appeared to stay in one place while the ship moved past them. They were hovering, but didn't disturb the water below them. Just as they went out of sight, the far-left object splashed and disappeared. Into the water, Hudson Valley UFO Sightings New York's Hudson River Valley has been a UFO hotspot for years, with countless reports of strange phenomena in the area. Thousands of residents between 1983 and 1986 claimed they had witnessed a large metallic object hovering in the sky. Dennis Sant had worked for the local government for 17 years. On March 17, 1983, while Dennis was at home in Brewster, New York, spotted something in the sky, describing it as an exceptionally large object. The structure was dark gray, metallic, and was almost silent. The lights were bright as they stood out in the sky, looking like a city of lights. It just paused in the sky. As the object started to move, Dennis Sant expressed a feeling of fright. The thought of how this is moving and who is moving it. A thought of an encounter with something extraterrestrial. Dennis wasn't the only one witnessing such an extraordinary event. However, just a few miles away on Interstate 84, traffic came to a standstill as commuters left their vehicles in order to catch a glimpse of the same mystery craft. The phenomena that had occurred that night would return after a week had passed. Officer Andy Sadoff of the Newcastle Police was on routine patrol when he also claimed to have witnessed the craft. He stated, as I set up doing some routine checks looking for speeding cars, I looked up to the sky and saw a series of lights. At first it looked like a plane quite far away. However, it was very large. The lights were made up of white and green. It approached my vehicle and paused in its tracks and just hovered above. He described a feeling of amazement and awe, a knowing of the object but knowing this wasn't something of Earth. With no noise, no sound, no engine. This object was completely silent. It was triangular in shape and was as large as a football field. At the same time, Officer Andy Sandoff was looking up at the UFO. Another eyewitness report came in. Ed Burns, a computer engineer, was on his way home, commuting along the Taconic Parkway around 10 miles north of Andy Sandoff's location. Ed pulled off the road and joined a group of around 20 other motorists who had also stopped in amazement. Joined by thousands of other witnesses who all claimed to have seen the same phenomena. Since the thousands of reports which came in throughout the 1980s, there have been countless more ever since, making the Hudson Valley one of the USA's hot spots for UFOs. History of triangular shaped UFOs. All kinds of shapes and sizes of UFOs have been reported with the most popular being similar to the flying saucers we often see in Hollywood movies. Aside from this, there have also been thousands of triangular-shaped UFO sightings that have been reported over the years. Often described as dark in color, completely silent and roughly the size of a football field, one of the most common triangular-shaped UFO sightings was in Belgium. That lasted from November 1989 to April 1990. This particular UFO event has now become known as the Belgian Wave. Thousands of people claimed to have seen triangular-shaped UFOs at low altitude throughout the year. Among the first witnesses in November 1989 were two police officers on patrol in Eupen, Belgium, close to the German border. In March 1990, as the Belgian Wave peaked, Belgian Air Force sent two F- 16 fighter jets to investigate a triangular object that had appeared on radar. The pilots recorded the craft's remarkable maneuverability and its capability to accelerate from 1,000 kilometers per hour to 1,800 kilometers per hour within a matter of seconds. While these crafts are often attributed to being of alien origin, there's also other theories that are closer to home. 
Could these crafts be secret government projects? David Marler, UFO researcher, states he has reviewed more than 17,000 case files based on unidentified triangular crafts. Marler says that given their hovering behavior, they might be engaged in surveillance of some nature, scanning or analyzing the topography. Christopher Mellon, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Intelligence, claims there have been many instances in which these objects have been observed over bases operated by the Strategic Air Command. Many of these cases are dismissed simply as regular objects which have become distorted due to atmospheric conditions. Despite officials offering scientific explanations for the sightings, triangular UFOs are an international phenomenon with sightings over London, Belgium, the U.S., and many more countries. Between 1983 and 1986, the Hudson Valley UFO sightings is one of the more prominent triangular UFO cases in history, as it was reported by so many people. Kevin Sorovia, a retired lieutenant from the Yorktown Police Department, was another of the witnesses who described a large, silent craft around 100 yards wide. He said the craft hovered low before making a 45-degree turn and then suddenly speeding off. Looking for an explanation, he decided to call Stewart Air Force Base, located nearby in Newburgh, and asked whether any of its C-5 transport planes had been flying in the area that night. But none had. At the time, the C-5 was the world's largest and heaviest aircraft. Though triangular-shaped UFOs are common, one theory which offers a possible explanation for the phenomena is called the airship effect. This is a theory that suggests people who see unrelated lights in the sky can trick themselves into believing they are all part of the same object. So, if people see three lights in the night sky, they assume they must be of a triangular craft. Whatever theories people use to try and explain these sightings, one thing remains. It's hard to prove exactly what people saw and it still remains a mystery. What do you make of these UFO and USO mysteries? Humans have a hunger for hidden or secretive discoveries and find satiation when questions are answered. The knowledge humans crave about the unknown is what keeps scientists and researchers asking questions humans thrive to know. Books, films, even entire genres of entertainment have been dedicated to the tempting sensation of finding a once-hidden secret in the middle of a sprawling jungle. We are continually amazed at the new discoveries made by scientists and researchers across the globe. Hidden plane there are a few places you might expect to find a plane, but you would be forgiven for thinking the last place on Earth you might stumble upon one is in the middle of the thick jungles of Papua New Guinea. So how did a World War II B-17E bomber end up in one of the most unlikely spots on the globe? Well, the story spans decades, countries, and even continents, but we can first begin in the Second World War. The United States had remained uninvolved in the war effort between the Allies and the Axis up until this point. That was until the attack on Pearl Harbor which drove them to join arms with the side that would ultimately win the war. While the U.S. sent many soldiers to fight the Nazis in Europe, it was also focused on dealing with the threat of the Japanese Empire after the Pearl Harbor attack, and the U.S. subsequently sent hundreds of thousands of men to fight the Nazis. To fight in what is known as the Pacific War. While not as commonly thought of in comparison to the combat in Europe, at least 10,000 U.S. men lost their lives in the Pacific War. During the fight in the Pacific in 1942, one specific plane, a B-17E Flying Fortress, was sent on a raiding mission to the then-occupied island of New Britain in Papua New Guinea. While the plane suffered damage from the defenses of the Japanese forces, plane did not crash from damage alone. In fact, the plane was forced to make an emergency crash landing due to the plane running totally out of fuel. The Flying Fortress was supposed to land back in Australia, but instead the B-17E nosedived directly into the Agiambo Swamp on February 23, 1942. The plane's captain, Captain Fred Eaton, and the rest of the crew survived and was forced to withstand the harsh wilderness of the New Guinean jungle. For six weeks, the men managed to fend off starvation, the sweltering heat, as well as diseases in an unfamiliar region, and eventually managed to reunite with American troops. Despite the whereabouts of the men being resolved, the plane lays in the New Guinea jungle for decades afterwards, leaving many to wonder of its condition. 
Fast forward to the 1980s and plans to retrieve the relic bomber began to move forward thanks to the efforts of pilot and collector David Talish. It would only be in 2010 that the infamous bomber known in plain circles as the Holy Grail would eventually be recovered. Seen as the most uniquely preserved of the world's four recovered B-17E airplanes and given the nickname Swamp Ghost, is a fascinating time capsule preserved from one of the most historically significant periods in human history. Raised by monkeys in this part, we'll be learning about the infamous tale of Marina Chapman, the woman who was raised by a group of Capuchin monkeys. Due to the nature of the story, not much is known about Mrs. Chapman. Born in Colombia around the year 1950, Marina Chapman had a childhood very different to most people. According to Chapman's own testimony, at a very young age, she was mysteriously taken from her village, which she was too young to know the name of, before being abandoned for an unknown reason in the jungle of Colombia. Being a small, vulnerable child, Chapman states that she then spent the next number of years in the company of a colony of Capuchin monkeys, a small species of monkey found all across Central and South America. The monkeys apparently took a liking to Marina, as she stated that they looked after her, and managed to lead her to safety for what she estimates was a total of five years spent in the jungle. Eventually, Marina was found by a group of hunters in the Colombian jungle and was once again brought back into civilization. Again, according to Chapman, at this point she was unable to speak any human language and she fell into a series of problems as she re-entered human society. Marina claims that she was eventually sold and became homeless and lived on the street, and at one point Marina states she was taken in by a mafia family as a slave. But Marina Chapman's life took a fortunate turn for the better as she got older. Neighbor and friend Maruja, her daughter Maria, adopted the young girl when she was roughly 14 years old. Marina had finally become part of a family. The newly formed family unit with connections to the city of Bradford in the UK moved over to the green and pleasant land in 1977. Once there, Chapman became a nanny and has lived in Bradford since 1983. Whilst this is an amazing tale, there's still some ambiguity about Marina's story. Since there is nobody to verify the woman's tale, we have no concrete way of proving whether what she says is true or false. Regardless, the story of a young girl rescued by a family of small monkeys has proven to be so fascinating that National Geographic produced a documentary film about Maria named Woman Raised by Monkeys in 2013. Hidden ancient city discovering the ruins of an ancient city, surrounded by the sprawling plant life of a jungle, is a fantasy that many of us had in our youth. There's still something about uncovering the remnant of ancient civilizations that just gets the blood pumping. Many ancient ruins may still be out there waiting to be discovered. Since new technologies are allowing scientists more and more ways to find what was previously invisible, the possible outcomes for future ruin discoveries are looking more and more positive. One amazing example is the network of Mayan ruins discovered in 2018. The Mayan people have been seen as a cornerstone of human civilization, with a deep and complex understanding of architecture, culture, and religious practices that still amazes historians today. Yet, nobody was expecting the extent of the discovery made in 2018, when over 60,000 Mayan ruins were uncovered in Guatemala. While archaeologists had already spent years mapping out the region known as El Sats, the development of LIDAR technology allowed researchers to create a detailed map of the area's surface from above much faster than before. To give an idea of how dense the jungle is in this area, one archaeologist stated that one of the finds was within 150 feet, but due to thick vegetation they had never spotted it. The LIDAR technology shaved years off of the team's overall workload, and it has uncovered an unbelievable amount of previously unknown Mayan ruins, including walls, moats, roadways, and fortresses. Some of the most interesting finds from the discovery include a seven-story pyramid that was completely hidden by foliage, as well as an intricate network of raised highways that connected all of the Mayan cities in the local area. These networks are particularly fascinating as they show signs of heavy use, indicating that trade between cities was frequent. Stephen Houston, a professor of archaeology and anthropology at Brown University, 
stated this discovery is one of the greatest advances in over 150 years of Mayan archaeology. LiDAR imagery is a new tool that spots archaeological points of interest that would otherwise be invisible to us humans. Using remote sensing technology, LiDAR uses beams of lasers pointed at the ground to create an image map of the area's surface. The beams then bounce back and the wavelengths are measured, giving an accurate picture of what lies below. The find in Guatemala has made historians completely rethink what they thought of the Mayan people. Observing the thousands upon thousands of ruins, it could be possible that the civilization population was three to four times bigger than we once believed. Mr. Estrada Belli said, with this new data, it's no longer unreasonable to think that there were 10 to 15 million people there, including many living in low-lying, swampy areas that many of us had thought uninhabitable. One caveat to this discovery is that while the find is a phenomenal discovery, researchers have their work cut out for them, as the Elzat site is likely to house more than 3,000 years of Mayan civilization. This means that lots of the finds may be from completely different periods in Mayan history, and it'll take a long time to accurately study and catalog each and every one of them. Still, it goes to show that there could be an untold number of things waiting to be discovered in our planet's jungles. But what do you make of these jungle discoveries? Underwater bases sounds like works of fiction, or something you would hear in a movie. However, the reality is there's many secret bases scattered across our planet some of which everyday people don't know about. Some amateur researchers have even said it's likely that governments do have underwater bases, and this wouldn't be out of the scope due to the advantages they would have. After all, having bases located beneath the waves would come in handy in many ways. For example, recently there's been images captured of a Chinese submarine departing an underwater base, which revealed that the idea of underwater bases is very much a reality, and caused some to say that if China has done this, it's likely that other countries have or will follow in their footsteps. Then there's those people that suggest that underwater bases aren't built for or used by us, but rather they've been used by an advanced race that call this planet home. Google Earth allows anyone to scan the planets from the comfort of their home, and this has caused many interesting discoveries to be made in recent years, and perhaps one of the most interesting ones is that of the Malibu Underwater Alien Base. This interesting discovery started to make headlines when it was first discovered, and that's because people labeled this as an underwater alien base, and this is one of those cases where you can understand why. At first glance, the object does look to resemble that of a building, with what appears to be large pillars holding up the bulk of the object. The discovery was made six miles off the coast at Point Doom in Malibu, California. The object pretty much sits on the seabed, looks to be oval in shape and is pretty large. Google Earth images revealed this object is in fact massive, measuring in at around three having what appears to be pillars and even a large entrance. It's not hard to imagine why various theories have been put forward to try and explain it. According to various websites that look into UFOs and the paranormal, they suggest that the massive structure is a UFO in USO base. Many people have heard of unidentified flying objects, but many may not be aware of unidentified submerged objects. These are unidentified flying objects that are seen in and around oceans, with some people even claiming that they've seen these crafts entering the water without making a splash. It's not just random people who have reported seeing these crafts either. People in the military have seen these large UFOs enter the water without making a sound, and even reported them staying under the water for several hours. It's these types of reports that have caused some to think that there's bases under the oceans that these crafts use, and that perhaps they could be part of something much bigger. These USOs are reported to look very similar to UFOs, and it's caused some to question whether the two are different, or whether normal UFOs have the ability to go underwater without being detected. Regardless, when the underwater discovery was found, it was hailed as being one of the best discoveries in regards to USOs and that it may just prove that they do exist after all. One UFO researcher said the following about the discovery. What's interesting about this discovery is how artificial it looks. I've seen reefs, cliffs, and other underwater structures, but there's something about this that looks different. As many have pointed out, it seems to have giant pillars, as if it's this that holds up the structure itself. 
This and the many reports made around the era of UFOs has caused it to be a hot spot, and you can't blame people for thinking this may be connected to UFOs in US homes. One thing that stands out is how the object itself looks like a giant UFO. When you look at it from a bird's point of view, it looks to be oval-shamed. Everything here also looks as though it was made. It looks symmetrical. When you view things in nature, even things that humans have built, they hold their shame. For example, when people discover things like shims, we're still able to tell that it's a ship. So that's another thing about this object that stands out. The fact that it looks to be a type of building. End quote. However, not everyone agrees with the idea this is linked to USOs, with David Schwartz of the U.S. Geological Survey coming forward and saying the following, I didn't see anything special about it. I think it's because it looks like there's a flat surface, and then below it looks like there's these vertical columns. So somebody can say, I think this is an entrance to something special. I think it's natural and is part of the continental shell. It's just a complicated part of what's now offshore, and that it's seen some erosion, and maybe slumping when perhaps this was partially exposed when sea level was lower. This is a really major earthquake area, and perhaps some of these features are a result of slope failures, which is due to shaking. There's no flag under the water that says I'm an entrance to an alien base. There's nothing unnatural looking about it. It's just showing some sort of variation in the offshore coastal morphology. End quote. Although officials think the structure is natural and definitely isn't an alien base, there's still some that think this isn't the case, and that the many USOs that have been reported back up the claims that this is something more mysterious. Although people can say their thoughts on whichever one you believe. One thing to bear in mind is that over 95% of our ocean remains unexplored, and that every year scientists and researchers are still making incredible discoveries beneath the waves. In fact, it's said that every year scientists discover between 1,000 and 2,000 new species, showcasing just how little we know about the underwater world. Underwater archaeologists are even finding ancient ruins beneath our oceans, showing us that at one point in time people would have lived here. It's likely that as the years go on, scientists and amateur researchers are going to find more interesting discoveries. Whether they will agree on what they found, though, is another matter. So what do you make of this interesting structure? Do you agree with the U.S. Geological Survey that this is natural? Or do you think this is something more mysterious? Also, what do you make of the reports of unidentified submerged objects? And how they are able to allegedly navigate our oceans without being detected? The chaos and confusion of everyday life can get us focusing on everything that's going wrong. Therefore, it's easy to overlook some of the fantastic new discoveries that have been made just this year. The mystery safe, what do you do when a safe appears in the middle of a field with nothing but a note attached to it? That's a question that farmer Kirk Mathis faced in late August when he found a metal safe that did not belong to him lying out in the sun. Its appearance alone was daunting enough, but what was even more surprising was the lack of any clues and hints as to how or when it got there. The safe had an estimated weight of 500 to 600 pounds. So there was no question that it had to have been transported there with the help of heavy machinery. Many wondered how it could be possible for anyone to do that without making enough sound to draw attention to what was happening. At least the farmer did not have to worry about returning it to anyone. The note on it reads simply, if you can open it, you can keep it. Some people thought maybe opening the safe wasn't the best idea and for good reason. What if there was something dangerous inside? Fear of the unknown didn't stop everyone from trying. People fiddled with the hinges, knocked off the dial and handle, and even tried taking a sledgehammer to the metal, beating it up and denting it. However, this came with no luck. It remained unopened and eventually the police showed up to disperse the crowds that had gathered to see what was going on. The farmer himself was less inclined to open the safe, but for different reasons. He told reporters that he believed leaving it closed would allow for the mystery to live on, for people to imagine alternatives and maybe get people's minds off from the devastating virus of 2020 and difficulties of this year. In the end, Mathis decided to keep this safe in his barns. He said he planned to move it somewhere else, where it could be well hidden and protected from break-ins and strangers' attempts to open it. 
Who knows what might hap, maybe if he hides it well enough, it'll take another many years before someone else finds it and has to make the choice again. To take the risk and open it or leave it for another person in another time. The Old Cave Bear As permafrost melts across Russia's region of Siberia, more old bones and remains of animals from thousands of years ago have been discovered, including mammoths, rhinos, lion cubs, and now a bear from the Ice Age. Well-preserved remains of an old cave bear were discovered on Bolshoi Lyakovsky Island in the East Siberian Sea in early September. When reindeer herders stumbled across the carcass, they quickly alerted researchers and scientists at the Northeastern Federal University at Chukost, who were interested in this news. It is the first and only of its kind, a bear in its entirety. It was determined to have lived during the time of woolly mammoths, mastodons, and saber-toothed tigers during the Ice Age. This seems like a lucky coincidence, as a preserved cave bear cub was also discovered a little earlier. This was exciting news for the researchers whose speciality lies in Ice Age animals. These bears went extinct more than 15,000 years ago, and the only remains ever found until now were fragments of bones or skulls. This is the first example of an almost wholly preserved bear carcass, with its teeth, nose, soft tissue, and all its internal organs nearly completely intact. Now, scientists have the chance to do even deeper and further research into the species. The discovery was called groundbreaking by university researchers and scientists. This is the latest and one of the greatest additions to a growing collection of preserved Ice Age carcasses that have been emerging from the melted permafrost. What does it weigh? When exactly did it live? What caused the extinction of this species? Was it human interference, hunting, or natural causes? These are all questions that researchers and scientists may now be able to answer as a result of this extraordinary discovery. A preliminary analysis determined that this specific bear must have lived between 22,000 to 29,500 years ago, but we won't know the exact age until a radiocarbon analysis is conducted. According to a study in 2018, these bears could weigh between 1,100 to 3,300 pounds, which would be larger than the modern polar bear. Further analysis from various parts of the carcass may give us even more information on how the bear lived and passed away. Its teeth could reveal what its diet was, and evidence about the territory and habitat in which it lived. Analysis of any contents that may have remained in its stomach will tell us whether it was a carnivore, herbivore, or omnivore. Most interesting of all, ancient DNA analysis could provide clarification on its evolutionary history and back. The supernova. Scientist Carl Sagan has said that we humans are made of star stuff. This may sound like a line of poetry, but what he has said has some truth in it. While we may not exactly be made of stars in their entirety, it turns out that elements discovered in the aftermath of the star, scientifically referred to as a supernova, contains just the same stuff found in human bodies, and indeed the world as a whole. Supernovae are explosions caused when a star larger than the sun collapses. These explosions carry with them silver, nickel, copper, calcium, and iron, amongst other elements found in our own bodies. They are extremely bright and powerful explosions due to producing massive amounts of energy from its core, which causes the star to become extremely hot. Eventually, the pressure from the core cannot withstand its own gravitational force, causing the star to collapse. Astronomers discovered a supernova explosion from a star larger than the Sun, the S9-2016 APS. It was discovered by scientists at the Center for Astrophysics. Although the SN-2016 APS supernova was first spotted in 2016, scientists have been studying it and finding more information about the star itself and the collapse of it. It is the brightest, most energetic, and likely biggest supernova ever to be observed. With an explosion strength 10 times the energy of most normal-sized supernovas, the research team was able to measure it using the total energy of the explosion and its radiation. They found that the SN2016 APS emitted five times the explosion energy of a typical supernova. They were also able to discover that its mass was 50 to 100 times more than the sun's. Normal supernovae are typically around 15 times as large as the sun. This collapse happened 4 billion light years away. 
Therefore, looking at it is much like looking back in time, as it takes all that time for evidence of these explosions to reach the Earth. Scientists suggest that the extraordinary brightness and energy levels may hint at something even more interesting, what is known as a pulsational pair instability supernova. This is when two massive stars merge before exploding, which may explain its unusual size, radiation, and light emission. The theory is that two stars combined just before the explosion, causing a notable increase in hydrogen and a mass high enough to trigger the pair instability and therefore the explosion. A follow-up study of SN 2016 APS revealed high levels of hydrogen gas. This is unusual because larger stars tend to lose their hydrogen to powerful stellar winds when becoming supernovae. It is only stars with lower masses that can hold onto their hydrogen because the explosions are not as formidable and therefore allow for more attention. This supernova is the first of many that scientists hope to discover and research, and it is believed that it has opened the pathways to greater discoveries. With their more powerful telescopes, they will be able to find more and more supernovae like this one. Discovering these supernovae are a form of looking back in time, back to the early history of the universe. Scientists hope to find even earlier and older supernovae, and they believe that they will. If there's anything we can take away from these discoveries, it's that the world is a surprising and fascinating place. Whether in a field in the middle of New York or the Siberian Arctic or out in space, there's always something to find out and learn about. Evidence of the past can remind us that much has happened and therefore will happen, but that the universe and the earth carry on. Whether an unexplained extinction or the collapse of thousands of stars, the universe has survived. The past shows us that a future is possible, and we are living in it. Even if much is left to mystery, what we do find out and get to know is exciting and fascinating. And even if we don't always know everything now, someone, Somewhere will one day open the mystery safe of the universe, and we'll be able to look back on the once ambiguous history with fresh eyes. But what do you make of these recent discoveries? Space, that vast realm full of more mysteries than certainties, constantly taunting those researchers who peer through telescope lenses at the immeasurable emptiness that lies beyond our atmosphere. Although new discoveries are constantly being made thanks to the constantly improving technology that we have at our disposal, these discoveries do not always provide us with exact answers about space. In fact, frequently, a new discovery means uncovering even more mysterious and unanswerable questions. Supermassive black hole at our galaxy's center suddenly lit up. Black holes are an entity that many space fanatics are fascinated with, and Sagittarius A-star is no exception. Despite the connotations of the name, a black hole is far from empty. In fact, on average, black holes contain roughly 10 times the matter of our sun squeezed into an area roughly equal to that of New York City. This incredibly concentrated mass is one of the most massively dense areas in the universe and has such a large gravitational pull that nothing, not even light particles can escape creating the visual impression of a great emptiness. Because no light, electromagnetic, or radio waves can escape a black hole. They can't be viewed with any telescope or imaging methods, and the presence of a black hole must be deduced through studying the effect on its gravitational pull on nearby matter. As dust and gas are rapidly sucked in by this massive gravitational pull, a large amount of heat is generated, which gives off a flickering glow when viewed with an ultraviolet telescope. This vacuum-like phenomenon is called accretion, and the flaming disk around the mouth is known as the accretion disk. Residing at the galactic center of the Milky Way and measuring over 22 million kilometers wide, with a mass equal to that of 3.6 million suns, Sagittarius A-star has been classified as a supermassive black hole by NASA. Within the past year, scientists have noticed that Sagittarius A-star's accretion disk has begun flaring approximately 75 times brighter than it has in the 20 years since monitoring first began. Since space has existed for billions of years, it has established a pattern of relative constancy and predictability. So any change in behaviors of galactic bodies is noteworthy. Although researchers are unsure as to the exact reason why the secretion glow is so much brighter, they theorize that it could be that more gas is being sucked into the mouth causing more heat to be generated. 
A second theory speculates that a large gaseous object named G2, which has been approaching Sagittarius' a star since 2014, has finally been engulfed. However, these theories are unconfirmed and scientists admit they cannot definitively say why the glow has increased by such a large amount. Some acknowledge that the black hole could also potentially be expanding as it continues to suck matter in and increase its mass. Although black holes do not move around the galaxy and Sagittarius a star has been anchored in the same place for billions of years, as more and more matter folds into its mouth, the mouth will inevitably continue to expand. Currently classified as a supermassive, perhaps the increased glow indicates that Sagittarius A star is well on its way to joining the ranks of the categorically ultramassive. Nonetheless, at over 25,000 light years away, it is safe to say that we have several million years before we have to be worried about our galaxy collapsing into the hungry mouth of Sagittarius A star. GRB 190114C Gamma Ray Burst Gamma Ray Bursts are incredibly powerful astronomical events that were first noted by scientists around 46 years ago. Although mysterious and not fully understood, they are fairly common and can be observed randomly in space almost every day. The most common cause of a gamma ray burst is when an enormous star, exponentially larger than our own sun, runs out of fuel. The core collapses on itself, forming a black hole, which then projects particle rays from inside the blast through the outer remnants of the star. These initial particle rays react with the mass around it to form hugely powerful jets of gamma rays, which are the most highly energetic wavelength and move at almost 100% the speed of visible light. These initial bursts last for only a minute or two, followed by what scientists have termed the afterglow. This afterglow surrounds the site of the burst for several months following the event and is caused by the continued interaction of the ejected jets with surrounding space particles, which emit light on all frequencies across the wavelength spectrum from radio waves to gamma rays. Such a collapse of matter resulting in long-lasting jets of incredibly powerful gamma waves is collectively known as a gamma-ray burst phenomenon and is widely studied in the field of astronomy. Previously, because the initial bursts are so short-lived and occur randomly in space, research regarding this phenomenon was limited to what astrologists could observe from the long-lasting afterglows, which are a representation of the burst event at lower energies. Because these events are the most powerful explosions in the universe, and understanding is limited to conclusions gathered from study of the phenomenon at its least energetic form, to view and capture the initial gamma-ray burst, not just the afterglow for analysis, and on the afternoon of January 14, 2019, they had a stroke of luck. NASA's Fermi Gamma-ray Space Telescope and Neil Girl's Swift Observatory detected the gamma radiation from a pair of enormous bursts originating from the Fornax constellation and alerted the major atmospheric gamma imaging Cherenkov Observatory which was able to automatically detect and record the burst of a mere 50 seconds after it began. The two gamma-ray bursts, named GRB 190114C, emitted the highest energy rays ever witnessed in such an event, making the gamma rays projected from the site of the burst the highest energy wavelengths ever recorded. Researchers are still attempting to determine whether or not the unusually dense environment of the system which occurred at the nuclear center of several interconnected galaxies was what might have been conducive to such a large burst. This documentation of a component of a gamma-ray burst that has not been able to be widely studied, especially when the event in question is the largest ever recorded, will help scientists to look at gamma-ray theory from an entirely new perspective. Further analysis of the recordings of the initial event compared with continued study of the afterglow will radicalize the way that scientists study gamma-ray theory. NASA launched an atomic clock into space. Atomic clocks have been hailed as the superior method of timekeeping since the 1950s due to their incredible accuracy, even over extremely long periods of time. Where pendulums and quartz crystal clocks develop discrepancies and can vary between devices, Atomic clocks use the frequency of electrons vibrating back and forth when exposed to radio waves, which is an almost impossibly precise method of measurement, and one that allows GPS satellites to pinpoint locations with nearly complete accuracy. These GPS satellites work by using an atomic clock to measure the amount of time it takes for a signal to travel between two points, a necessarily precise science in space travel where the difference of a single second can mean either landing on Mars or ending up hundreds of thousands of miles away. However, one limitation of the atomic clock is space. 
Each clock paired with the GPS satellite is about the size of a refrigerator and must remain on Earth when navigators use its measurements to triangulate the location of spacecraft and then communicate instructions to the astronauts on board. It is a time-consuming process and limits the distance of missions as spacecraft must remain within range of the GPS satellites and Earth. An onboard atomic clock would mean that the astronauts could calculate their own trajectory, rather than relying on communication from Earth for direction. However, the current design of an atomic clock is too bulky and will not stand up to the changing environment of space travel, which limits the possibilities of astronauts exploring deep space. Until recently, there has been no reliable method for keeping time while outside of Earth's gravitational pull. In June of 2019, NASA placed their newly developed deep space atomic clock on a spacecraft to orbit Earth for a year. The deep space atomic clock was developed at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California and has been in experimental orbit since June as they test its accuracy over extended periods of time outside of Earth's controlled environment. If the timekeeping remains unaffected by the conditions of space, the Deep Space Atomic Clock will be the first atomic clock with the design and functionality to pioneer expeditions in the cosmos. That the clock, which is powered through mercury-ion technology, is 50 times more stable than current atomic clocks on GPS satellites and will lose one second every 10 million years. If it upholds these measurements as it orbits on the spacecraft, independent space travel could be much closer than we think. Increasing technology has allowed us to increase our understanding of the galaxy and has answered many questions that were previously thought unanswerable. However, the longer we observe the cosmos around us and the further we venture into those mysterious depths, the more we realize how very little we truly understand and grasp about the mechanics of space. Perhaps one day we will be able to locate alien life or even establish colonies on other planets. But even then, we may never know exactly how many more mysteries lie hidden within the immeasurable expanse of the Milky Way and beyond. But what do you make of these fascinating space discoveries? Reports of alien reductions, close encounters, and strange sightings have begun surfacing in the modern day. A number of alien organizations have begun categorizing reports and looking at the most commonly reported alien sightings from around the world to uncover deeper secrets and understand impossible to explain mysteries surrounding the extraterrestrial phenomenon. One interesting report comes from a retired carpenter named Jerry Battles, age 65, who claimed that he'd been abducted by aliens. The event took place back in December of 2001. In 2016, Jerry told his story to the mainstream media. He said that on the day of his abduction, the skies were clear. He said the following, he could have read a book with the light off the night sky, but I wasn't drawn by the light of the stars or the moon, but from a bright surgical white light coming from the other end of the street. It was around 8 p.m. when he was returning home from the pump. As he was traveling down the street, he noticed a bright light. As he approached it, he could see the light getting brighter, then suddenly there was a bright flash. After this, he woke up inside a craft. He had no idea how he got there, but remembered to observe his surroundings and stated there were 40 males of different ages on board the craft, but something seemed off about them. They were all in a trance-like state. He remembered seeing one man that was standing next to him, and they were dressed in a Columbo-style coat and hand. He also noted that he couldn't move any parts of his body except from his eyes saying that he felt like his whole body was in a state of paralysis, and no matter how hard he tried to move, he couldn't. He was then moved to a large chamber that had a 360-degree view, and it was there that he saw the first extraterrestrial. He remembered the being as having a large combed head and even interacting with it. The alien communicated with Jerry through telepathy and told him that he shouldn't be worried. Jerry then said the following, Should I be... The alien then asked Jerry what he most desired to see, to which Jerry replied the North Pole. Within seconds the craft, along with everyone on it, was transported to the North Pole, with Jerry not understanding how they were able to travel such a vast distance in a small amount of time. It was here that Jerry started to learn more about this alien species, claiming that they were over four million years more advanced than humans. 
and that they had been observing us and our way of life for thousands of years. It was then that the conversation took a dark turn, with Jerry asking when our world was going to end. The alien stated that a large asteroid roughly the size of a sissy and originating from the 35th quadrant would end our world in 850 years. According to Jerry, the alien said the following. In all that time you've only excelled at two things, global warfare and lying to your own species. You must use the force, be one with the force, harness the force. The alien went on to say that the majority of people don't understand the purpose of life, and this is because of the way that we live, with the alien not blaming the masses, but rather those that run the world. The alien also predicted that there would be a massive global financial crisis, and that things must change otherwise the human race will turn to dust. It's then said that Jerry was dropped off near a hospital. After attending the hospital, he then started to remember the events that had just played out. As you can imagine, he was confused about what he just experienced, and so decided to tell his friends about it. They didn't believe his story, though, and even went on to mock him. It's important to note as well that this story starts with him saying that he came out of a pub, and that's never a good start when you're trying to convince people that something otherworldly happened to you. Other people have told similar stories, and people just write this off as them being drunk. After all, when you're drunk you're not 100% aware of your surroundings. And you could understand why he would make these claims. It's hard for people to take these sorts of claims seriously, and one of the issues that abductees have is trying to prove the event happened. Many abductees have no proof of the event that they are describing, and this can cause doubt amongst many people. After all, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. But what if these stories are real? What if people are really being taken into these crafts? Imagine if that happened to you. Not only would it be a life-changing experience, but you then have to live with the fact that pretty much 99% of people are never going to believe your story. I've had conversations with abductees, and they say this is probably one of the more harder things about the abduction. Living the rest of their life being judged and knowing that no one will believe them. Or if they don't just start to speak up. Living the rest of your life not being able to talk to people. It seems that every year people are still claiming to have been abducted, with even more people seeing and videoing unidentified flying objects. UFOs certainly aren't anything new. There's some that say that more and more people are taking the subject seriously, with even the government opening up to the public about what they know. But for some, they still find it frustrating how some people downplay these crimes and act as if these incredible sightings are just nothing. Though many continue to debate UFOs and alien abductions, there seems to be a growing number of people that believe the eyewitnesses and state that something truly bizarre is happening. UFO researchers say that as each year passes, we get one step closer to understanding what these objects are and why they're so interested in our planet. So what do you guys make of alien abductions? Do you think that people who come forward with these stories are telling the truth? Or do you think that something else happened? The recent video has been making the rounds on Russian websites. The footage claims to be that of a UFO. But what's different about this is the way in which the UFO was captured. The story allegedly goes that there was a UFO that made contact with our planet, and when it did, very strange pieces of metal could be found around the site. One man who witnessed the event unfold quickly made his way to the scene. Once there, he noticed that no one was around, and so quickly collected some pieces of debris from the site. The object he picked up was described as being a type of metal-like crystal. However, when he looked through this, he was surprised to see ships in the sky. He even managed to record one craft through the crystal. After the video and images were uploaded online, many claim that these ships don't want to be seen and that they use a type of energy field. Other UFO researchers said that because the metal was from a UFO ship, it allowed the person to see the invisible ships. However, others have said the story seems a little far-fanged, and what we're seeing here is just a CGI UFO. Regardless, there's others who believe that UFOs do disguise themselves, and that when you use things like night vision cameras, these crafts become visible. There's some that claim this is the reason why some people don't notice unidentified flying objects, 
and that whoever is piloting these crafts use this technology for abductions. One interesting account is that of Gabriella Versigi, often described by UFO researchers as one of the first alien abduction reports made in the United Kingdom. The abduction of Gabriella Versaggi demonstrated the almost apathetic nature of humanoid aliens and what they seem to be capable of when it comes to the experimentation of human beings against their will. First reported on the 16th of October back in 1973, a woman by the name of Gabriella Versaggi claims to have been taken on board an alien spaceship according to the alien abduction account. Gabriella was driving down the motorway passing by the Langford Budville exit outside of the small village of Somerset in England. She noticed that the motorway was completely deserted, except for the blinding glare of a single headlight that appeared to be in the distance remaining stationary in its position. As she continued driving forward, getting closer to the bright light, her car suddenly lost all power, and her engine completely stormed. Uncertain as to the cause of the sudden engine stall, Gabriella exited the car and lifted her car hood to fix what could have been the issue of the car suddenly losing power. It was at this moment that Gabriella claimed that her large hands suddenly grabbed her by the shoulder and forced her to the ground in front of her car, as an overwhelmingly loud humming sound could be heard at a deafening sound. As she fought against her unseen attacker, she turned to face the figure only to see what she described as a tall metallic-colored humanoid that appeared to be far more robotic than human. It was at this moment that the robotic figure began to flash what she described to be a multicolored flickering light that floated in front of her view. She slowly felt herself losing consciousness as the flickering multicolored light came into view, causing her to black out beside her car. After an unknown period of time, Gabriella awoke in an empty field, already standing alongside the robotic figure that stood beside her and a strange bright object that seemed to float nearby. She once again heard the humming sound, before passing out to the bright object that floated nearby that also seemed to have been generating a loud humming noise as it levitated. As she got a better look at the unidentified flying object, Gabriella described the craft as being shaped similar to that as a half moon or dome, with a rounded top and a completely flat bottom. The levitating craft's color was silvery gray, and the entire craft extended out to thick legs that it appeared to rest on. Although she could only see two of the extended legs, Gabriella believed there was more than two legs, as she said that these did not appear to be able to support the craft alone. Standing on its metallic legs, the craft appeared to be more than 20 feet in height, with 40 feet in diameter, having large oblong-shaped windows in the middle of the dome-shaped craft that pulled out the bright light of the craft. Overwhelmed by the spacecraft, the robotic figure and her abduction, she blacked out for a second time before walking up inside the craft itself. According to Gabriella, when she woke up inside the craft, she was in what she described as a completely circular room and was forcibly struck down to an examination table that was located in the center of the room. Despite being covered in a light blue blanket made of an unknown material, she was bound to the examination table with large rubber bands that forced her limbs apart and held down her wrists and ankles. As she glanced around the room, she felt as if the room was artificially called, with her body freezing on the metallic table, shivering in the cold. She noticed the robotic figure standing inactive towards one of the walls of the room, while a console sat to the right covered in a wide number of buttons and dials. She took special note when memorizing her surroundings, trying to find any significance in their creation, including memorizing the floor of the room, that she described as being covered in what appeared to be a dark-colored rubber matting. After a period of time of being restrained, three figures entered the circular room carrying boxes and cums. Each of the figures appeared to be around five and a half feet tall, slim in build wearing face masks, skull caps, tunics, long gloves that went up to the length of their elbows, and extremely long aprons that fell to their ankles. With every piece of their clothing being light blue in color, with emotionless humanoid eyes that were far more rounded than any normal human beings. It was at this moment that the figures began performing a series of medical examinations on her body, including gathering hair and nail samples, taking vials of her blood and prodding her in different areas with probing equipment. As the procedure took place, Gabriella noticed that the humanoid figures never breathed. 
or talk to each other throughout the entire examination, merely looking and nodding to each other occasionally. However, throughout the procedure, as she made several motions with her head towards the robotic figure, one of the three figures began to tell her what the purpose of the robotic humanoid was. They described that the humanoid was indeed a robot and was tasked with the sole purpose of finding and retrieving specimens to be studied, and it would not be active again until the end of the procedure. However, as the figure spoke to Gabriella, she noticed that its mouth did not seem to move, and no air seemed to be exhaled as it spoke, believing that it was possible that the figure was communicating telepathically with her throughout this examination. However, once the explanations were over, the nature of the exam became far more sinister. According to Gabriella, although she refuses to describe the event in detail, she claims to have been attacked by the figures. After the procedure was over, the robotic figure flashed multicolored lights once more, causing Gabriella to fall asleep once again. However, this time she woke up outside of her car on the deserted road. Completely distraught, she quickly got into her car and found out it was working again, with no issues whatsoever. She then drove home and immediately filed a report as to the impossible to explain UFO encounter and alien abduction event. What you guys make of this UFO sighting and the strange report made by Gabriella? People have told stories for generations. Some of these stories have been scary, some have been funny, and some have been quite chilling. Mankind has always had an interest in the paranormal, and we often wonder what other sort of life that we don't know about may inhibit our world and the universe. Whilst many stories are purely fictitious, some of the strangest and creepiest have in fact been real. Some of these stories have fantasized upon the topic of strange, mysterious creatures. Chicago's flying humanoid, now you might be wondering what a humanoid actually is. A humanoid is a science fiction term given to things that appear human-like, such as lifelike robots and some paranormal phenomena. In 2017 in Chicago, Illinois, multiple sightings of these types of beings were reported by members of the public. However, these humanoids were a little different to the robot-like figures people tend to think humanoids as. These were flying humanoids, and in order to fly, they needed something that would make them fly, and this came in the form of bat wings. Chicago residents reported sightings of huge human bats leaping from buildings and performing dramatic aerial maneuvers drawing gasps from crowds below. They were initially described by eyewitnesses as tall, feathered with wings and glowing red eyes. One journalist even described the creature as beautiful as they seemed to move in synchrony dancing between buildings and flying with grace. But their appearance wasn't pleasant and actually quite chilling. Many of the humanoids were spotted around the east side of Chicago, near Lake Michigan, which itself is known for unexplained activity such as UFO sightings. At the time, humanoid researchers believed that it was likely that it was three different humanoids that people were seeing. Each of these humanoids was between six to eight feet tall, with a jet black smooth wingspan of around 12 feet. Some even think that a few of these creatures may have been other paranormal beings, namely Lechuzas from Mexico. These are believed to be ancient Mexican witches that transform into owls or eagles, but would still be far too small to resemble the figures seen in Chicago. Humanoids have allegedly been spotted across the world for hundreds of years, but paranormal enthusiasts can't quite agree on what they actually are or do. One theory is that they are a type of time traveler, but this doesn't quite add up for the Chicago Files. After all, why would they want to present themselves in such a bizarre figure? Robot-like human-looking humanoids may fit the time travel theory a little better, but nobody is totally sure what the Chicago appearances could be attributed to. Other theories include the invasion of Earth by extraterrestrial beings, but for some reason this too seems a little far-fetched. Although witnessing humanoids is stigmatized as a bad omen or bad news, most people haven't experienced any adverse effects after seeing these creatures. A few nightmares or sleepless nights have been reported, but nothing particularly fascinating. No one really knows what humanoids are, especially these bat-like humanoids, but in all honesty, they do sound more like something out of a horror film than anything else. Some questions are meant to be left unanswered. Praying Mantis Humanoid back in Chicago for our second story. 
but this time were on the ground rather than at the top of a building. A couple were walking together in Chicago's Schiller Woods, a large, fairly flat area of woodland on the outskirts of Chicago Ahayer Airport. There isn't anything particularly special about Schiller Woods, but the area has been host to multiple deaths over the years, most predating our story by some time. However, this isn't what we're focusing on today. The couple, for whatever reason, were going to practice a pagan ritual in the woods. They completed the majority of this ritual, but towards the end they spotted something strange amongst the trees. The lady jumped up, startled at what she'd spotted, and thought they'd just seen the slender man. The figure was around seven or eight feet tall and had a strange gray complexion with big bulbar size the sort you'd find on an insect when viewed under a microscope. The witness explained, the creature had long arms that dropped below its knees and that these arms were attached to strange claw-like hands. The creature allegedly seemed keen to stay away from the couple and remained amongst the trees. It seemed reclusive and almost scared of them. The couple thought it would be best to leave the creature alone and hastily made their way back to the car. Still startled and feeling strangely in awe of what they just witnessed, the couple discussed whether either of them had noticed anything strange or different whilst they'd been practicing the ritual. Neither of them could think of anything, but on the way home, they noticed something. The area around the woods was normally densely populated with animals. All sorts of deer, raccoons, and other wildlife were commonly sighted near Shilla. However, on the night of the sighting, no wildlife was to be seen anywhere. Shilla woods were eerily quiet and empty. The creature that the couple saw had been described as a humanoid in the form of a praying mantis. Male praying mantis can fly, are long-bodied with disproportionately sized limbs. They're usually green, but given this one was seven feet tall and allegedly part human, it's forgiven for not totally conforming to the stereotype. Whatever the couple saw in Schiller woods that evening, we're sure that they're glad that things stayed behind the trees. The Willis Tower sighting back in Chicago, our final humanoid sighting story comes from the Willis Tower, a breathtaking skyscraper standing at 527 meters tall. In 2017, a man was innocently going about his day in the city until he looked up at the Willis Tower. As the man cast his gaze to the very top of the tower, he spotted something utterly bizarre and utterly fascinating as well as a bit disconcerting. A creature which looked about six feet tall and attached to its human-like body, it had a huge pair of wings that propelled it into the sky. It swooped low before soaring back off into the distance, leaving the witness understandably shaken. Unsure of what to do, the man contacted a local paranormal sighting researcher named Lon Strickler. He explained to Strickler that the creature reminded him of a mantis and was dark green in color. The being apparently mutated in flight, changing in its form and appearance. Strickler himself was well aware of humanoid sightings in the area and is one of the most prominent researchers in this field. But even he admitted it was unusual to see a humanoid of this type. They apparently tend to be black or gray and more bat-like in shape. This was the 22nd sighting in Chicago in 2017 alone, and it's been noted that humanoids tend to appear at dusk or during the night, especially in the Lake Michigan area. But despite the flurry of activity in 2017, Chicago's flying humanoid sightings seem to have gone a little quiet. Whatever paranormal goings-on are occurring near Lake Michigan, they sure make terrifying stories. Three rather strange, but somewhat intriguing and mysterious flying creature stories. These so-called humanoids might seem ridiculous for the majority of us, but for a handful of people out there, they're simply all too real. Yet, all of those who have witnessed these somewhat incredible creatures will agree on one thing. They definitely aren't the product of somebody's imagination. And given the number of sightings in one area over the course of a year, it's understandable why interest in humanoids grew. Whether you believe these sightings are real or not is a debate for another day. In the meantime, we are not sure whether to be amazed or scared. But what do you make of these mysterious flying creatures? Soldiers all over the world have traditionally been deployed to a variety of locations, ranging from deepest, 
darkest forests and scorching barren deserts to blazing war zones and trenches. With such exposure to some of the world's most volatile and secret places, strange things are bound to occur every now and again. But what if one of those missions suddenly took a truly weird turn? The military may be there to protect us, but they themselves have had a few otherworldly encounters over the years, encounters with a potential enemy the likes of which have never been fought against before. A U.S. soldier's eyewitness account. Our next story is a true eyewitness account from a soldier in the U.S. military. Names and other sensitive information have not been disclosed in the following account. I served in Iraq and I'd like to get my story out there. I don't want to say where I was deployed as I don't want to give too much information away. But one strange thing that did happen while I was there was the multiple UFOs that were witnessed by myself and others who were there. At the time, I never opened up and told people about this. It wasn't something I wanted people knowing. And after all, people who talk about these topics tend to get a label put on them. Regardless, these crafts would appear in the sky at around dusk. Sometimes they would be disc-shaped while other times they would be in the shape of an orb. The size of them varied, but I'd say that on average they were around 25 to 40 feet in length. When these objects first started to appear in the sky, me and others thought it may have been linked to the enemy. After all, it wasn't uncommon to see projectiles in the sky, but these things were different. They seemed to be under intelligent control, being able to go from one place to another in a matter of seconds. On one particular night, one of these UFOs came into view around 1,000 meters from where we were. You could see it because it was pulsating, not in the way that an airplane or helicopter gives off light, but rather it looked like the whole object was actually the light. It's tough to explain, but these things seem to have been made of light. On another night, one of these UFOs flew close to the ground, almost as if inspecting the area. After this, it shot up to the sky leaving a hole in the nearby cloud. To this day, me and my friends who witnessed these crafts have no idea what they were. The Edwards Air Force Base Encounter Edwards Air Force Base sits amidst the dusty plains of the Mojave Desert, home to the Earth's hottest place, Death Valley where temperatures fluctuate from scorching hot in the summer to freezing cold in the winter. The desert is a hostile and dangerous place, but it's also one of America's most fascinating places for a number of reasons. Geographically, the area is unique, and as we've mentioned, climate is too. Furthermore, the first space shuttle mission Columbia landed at Edwards on its return to Earth in April 1981. However, there's a reason much more relevant to this video as to why we're taking a look at the base. Edwards Air Force Base by location and the majority of its purpose is just a regular military installation, but it also serves a joint purpose. The base essentially controls activities at the nearby Homie Airport, also known as Groom Lake, also known as Area 51. One would imagine that some strange things must be seen late at night that far out in the desert, surrounded by nothing but open air and dusty expanses, and indeed one night in 1965 an air traffic controller at the base had a strange encounter with what he believed was a flying saucer. In 1965, Edwards, like U.S. Air Force bases all over the country, were on high alert for suspicious activity in the skies. Tension with the Soviet Union was mounting, and the most shocking thing that radar controllers in the Nevada desert could have seen back then would have been a Russian aircraft. However, the objects that appeared above the base, apparently flying very high and very fast, appeared in sets of 7 to 12 and looked like pulsating lights against the night sky. However, the controllers couldn't be sure of what they'd seen, and as a precaution, an F-106A fighter jet was scrambled from the nearby George Air Force Base at Victorville. Yet, the strange lights continued to climb into the night sky, far outpacing the fighter jet. Controllers noted that the craft seemed to simply fade away into space, becoming one of the stars. The thing about the Edwards incident is that the eyewitness reports were credible, so the crew at the base most definitely did see something that night, it's just not clear what it was that they saw. We don't know what sort of threat or how bad a threat these supposed UFOs posed, but when the evidence was released only about 15 years ago, people realized that the government had gone to great lengths at the time to cover up these sorts of incidents. Dobbins Air Force Base Encounter We're throwing back the years again to the 1950s, 
an era of economic boom, consumerism, and prosperity in the United States. Whilst the 50s in the States was undoubtedly an era of optimism for many, the country was also paranoid, sleeping with one eye open due to the threat of communism and Cold War posed by the Soviets. This paranoia also opened up avenues for conspiracy theories and UFOs were high up on that. List. Bruce Bleach was a tower operator at Dobbins Air Force Base near Atlanta, Georgia in the 50s. The base was one of a few that were designated as stopping points for top-secret aircraft such as the Blackbird and therefore staff required security clearance. The base was also a UFO sighting hotspot. So much so they installed a special 3D camera to photograph the craft when they appeared. Special forms also had to be signed when said sightings occurred. As we previously mentioned, the UFO craze was taking hold of America in the 50s, and Beach's first experience with extraterrestrials came when he was only 15. After attending a lecture on the matter, Beach was hooked, and it was around this time where his native Kansas began to play host to a number of not just UFO but actual alien sightings. When he applied to become a controller at Dobbins and underwent his basic training, Beach's instructors explained that sometimes what they thought were UFOs would appear on radar screens and in the skies around the base, and that they called in several experts from across the U.S. to try and explain the phenomena. One day, one of Beach's colleagues offered him the chance to see a UFO, claiming that he was a Rosicrucian, somebody who claimed to possess mystical wisdom. Yet, as the colleague had predicted, the night Beach and 20 other employees went to experience the UFOs for themselves, they did so. Beach described them as bright orange lights, and noted that two fighter jets had been scrambled to pursue the suspected UFOs. Another incident occurred some months later, but this time during the day. A small aircraft that was scheduled to make a routine inspection flight around the base, and upon closer inspection they saw what they believed was another UFO. Beach recalled, in varying light and varying angles one has to sometimes tilt their head to identify the aircraft silhouette and the type of aircraft they are observing. I couldn't see any wings. The UFO sightings didn't end there for Beach and the crew at Dobbins. They occurred again at Dobbins and even in the Arctic when Beach was stationed there for a period of time. These strange, luminous auras in the sky convinced Beach and many others of the existence of UFOs, and he's adamant that they aren't merely just theories. UFOs have been a thing of immense fascination across the world for thousands of years, but Americans were amongst the first to take continued interest in the phenomena. And when multiple soldiers, those who we trust with keeping us safe, are mind-boggled and ultimately convinced by their own sightings, you can't help but think that there might be something else out there. No matter what your thoughts surrounding these incidents, one thing that can't be ignored is that there are only two possible conclusions to make when it comes to repeated UFO sightings, either a truth within the story or false. What do you make of these UFO reports? Astronauts have perhaps one of the most interesting jobs in the world. They venture where very few have been and get to observe our planets from the comforts of the International Space Station. Over 560 people have made it into space, and with new discoveries in technology, it's said that within the next few years that number will increase dramatically, with space agencies looking at introducing space tourism within the next few decades. Couple this with agencies' efforts of colonizing planets such as Mars, and it's fair to say that interest in space is at an all-time high. The International Space Station is the most famous spacecraft that orbits our planet. It's a large spacecraft, and over the years various astronauts have called this place home. One of the most common things for astronauts to do is take incredible photographs of our planet. Interestingly though, some of these get more attention than others, and this is because of what can be seen in the background. One photograph taken by German astronaut Alexander Gerst made the rounds on social media back in 2014. The photograph was shared on the astronaut's Twitter profile, where it quickly gained a lot of attention, even going on to be featured in various mainstream media articles, where they suggested that what could be seen in the image was in fact a UFO. One news outlet reported that the image was huge, and measured in at around 5 to 7 miles in diameter, noting that whatever this object was, it looked very disc-like and seemed to have perfect symmetry. Various UFO websites posted about it first, one of which was Scott C. 
wearing of the UFO sightings daily website, and again noting that this object seemed to be the real deal. Even they admitted though that the object in question was not the best quality. They said the UFO could be seen over the ocean, with others making comparisons between UFOs and our oceans, stating that whatever these crafts are, they seem to be fascinated with bodies of water. Other UFO researchers stated the object wasn't actually in the sky, but rather under the however, this is unlikely as no clouds are above the object. If this photograph shows a UFO, it would make it one of the largest that's ever been captured on camera. As mentioned, estimations put the craft as being over five miles in diameter, with some saying that we don't have crafts that big or that shape, so it's definitely not one of ours. Others suggested that a more likely answer is that this is just a camera glitch. Sometimes these large images are put together using a variety of smaller images, so there's a possibility that this is just a gap that wasn't filled. Other online users weren't so impressed with the image, with one user saying the following, it seems that UFO researchers will label anything remotely strange as an unidentified flying object. The theories that are put forward are very out there. What's the most likely explanation? That this is a camera glitch? Or that aliens have traveled millions of miles in height aircrafts just to accidentally get captured in an astronaut's photograph? I think I know which one sounds the most plausible. Others argue that UFO researchers will see what they want, and that if there's something that even slightly resembles a UFO, they will immediately believe that's what's been photographed, when in reality there could be a very simple explanation. Others have hit back at these sorts of claims, and have said that space is one of the best places to find UFOs. UFO researchers have said that for so long we've been kept in the dark about this topic, and when discoveries like this are made it does seem strange, but this is because we've been told our whole lives that UFOs don't exist, and when anything strange is found scientists are trying to debunk it. Others have made some interesting connections between the government and UFOs, stating that if these crafts aren't real, why have government officials created numerous secret programs to investigate these crafts? Why have officials spoken out about these objects, claiming that they possess technology that exceeds ours? Others, though, defend the government's decisions to keep us in the dark about this subject, saying that the majority of people can't even handle basic information that's given to them. So how are the masses going to react when they're told that we are part of something much bigger? Going back to the NASA photograph, one interesting thing to note is that NASA had the original photograph on their website, but when you click on the link you're met with a 404 error. Some say it's strange how the image has been taken off the NASA website, stating that perhaps the image did show something mysterious, whereas others say that NASA remove images all the time and that it's likely just a coincidence. Another thing is that the image is also quite hard to find, with only a few websites still featuring the image. In recent years, it seems that more people are talking about unidentified flying objects. Going back several years ago, it was a topic that wasn't talked about or featured in the mainstream media. However, in recent years, this has changed. People now more than ever are openly talking about this topic, with even professionals like astronauts being open about their sightings. One person who came forward and talked about UFOs was that of Edgar Mitchell. Edgar Mitchell is perhaps best known for being the sick person to walk on the moon. Later on in his life, Mitchell became known in the UFO community for being open about the topic, and even going on to detail his encounter with UFOs. He believed that not only were UFOs real, but high-up government officials were hiding the truth from the public, going on to say that throughout his life he had many interesting conversations with high-up officials, and they told him events like Roswell were real. He didn't want to keep this sort of information bottled up, and so opened up about everything he'd been told. He said the following during an interview, I happen to have been privileged enough to be in on the fact that we've been visited on this planet and that the UFO phenomenon is real. In reply to this, a spokesman for NASA said the following, NASA does not track UFOs. NASA is not involved in any sort of cover-up about alien life on this planet or anywhere in the universe. Dr. Mitchell is a great American, but we do not share his opinions on this issue. So what do you make of these sorts of images? Do you think they show something mysterious? Or do you think they could be camera anomalies and glitches?
scientists have done a great job unraveling some of the mysteries of space. But it's fair to say that we still know very little about the universe. Recently, scientists have even come forward and said the human brain can't truly understand the full scale of it. The Matrix tells us there's no coincidences. This has caused some to say that when you see the same thing over and over or experience deja vu, this could be a glitch in the Matrix. The last theory that Stephen Hawking was working on before his death was recently revealed. Hawking was working on a theory that the universe may actually be a hologram. The peer-reviewed journal of high-energy physics published Hawking's final theory on the universe's origin, titled A Smooth Exit from Eternal Inflation. Hawking isn't the only person to investigate this theory. A UK, Canadian, and Italian study has provided what researchers believe is the first observational evidence that our universe could be a vast and complex hologram. People have been coming forward with their strange experiences, but it's these that has caused them to question our reality and purpose. Although it may sound like a joke, many have allegedly experienced glitches in the matrix and say that it feels like for a moment that the whole world comes to a standstill. The majority of these happen suddenly, with the eyewitness being left confused about what just happened. In some rare cases, though, people are able to capture footage of this playing out. One of these was captured by a man while he was passing Fort Lauderdale Airport. He said that as he was driving past the airport, he looked up to the sky and could see a plane not moving. Thinking it was some trick, he began to record the event. He said that it was like a glitch in the matrix and that the plane appeared to not be moving. Take a look at the footage. Some people were quick to give their opinions, saying that they've seen similar things. One person said the following, I saw something like this and it was really weird. I was driving past and the plane wasn't moving. It was like it was stuck in the sky. While another person said the following, I find videos like these really interesting, but I think I can explain it. It's an optical illusion caused by the current plane going in opposite directions. It just makes it look like the plane isn't descending, but in reality it is. Other people have spoken about their encounters with glitches in the Matrix. This girl encounters something strange while visiting a family member. They said the following, I'm a 20-year-old female and every summer since I was around 7 or 8 me and my family have been traveling up to New York to visit friends and family. The majority of the time we spend on our vacation is at my Uncle Joey's house in the Hamptons. One summer when I was between 10 or 11 years old, I remember having dinner with my mom, dad, brother, and uncle. It was our first night in the Hamptons on this particular vacation, and I remember going food shopping beforehand. My mom cooked my uncle a meal as he wasn't in a relationship at this time, so great home-cooked meals were scarce for him. After having eaten this incredible meal and being fully satisfied, I went upstairs to take a nap in the room I was staying in. This was my Uncle Joe's office. I lay down on the couch and vividly remember seeing my brother playing a game. He had his headphones on and was talking to his friends online. As the food was hitting me, I just curled up on the couch and closed my eyes, dozing off to the sound of his voice. After that, I was jolted awake by my mother yelling and shaking me. She was screaming at the top of her lungs, tears in her eyes asking where I'd been. I had no idea what she was talking about. My whole family then proceeds to come upstairs and question where I'd been for the last 30 minutes, and that they'd searched every inch of the house, even going out on the street looking for me. I told them the truth, that I was here taking a nap. But my mom didn't believe a word I said. She was furious in calling me a liar. She told me I couldn't come downstairs unless I told them the truth. This was incredibly hard because I wanted to convince them that I'd really not been playing tricks on them. I had been upstairs the whole time and that I fell asleep next to my brother. But I knew it wouldn't work. I knew in this state of mind they would never believe me. I'd just gone missing for 30 minutes and was nowhere to be found. I'd really scared my parents that my mom was incredibly emotional and sensitive. My uncle had told me that he thought his crazy neighbor next door had kidnapped me. Long story short, I had to confess and tell them that it was a prank. We moved past it quickly and, of course, enjoyed the rest of the vacation. I haven't brought it up in a while, but since then I've tried to tell them it wasn't a prank, 
and that I really don't know what happened, but they don't believe me. I know I won't ever get a solid explanation for this, but I just want to know if anyone has a theory of what this could have been. I haven't had any past experiences with sleepwalking. This house is also a little old and creaky, so it would be hard to move around swiftly without getting caught. If I did hide in my sleep, wouldn't they have found me if they searched every inch of this house? It's a question that I'll have to live with forever, but I can't think of any reasonable explanation other than the paranormal. So what do you guys make of this strange story? Also, what do you make of the plane video? Do you think it's a glitch? Or do you think it's where the car and plane is moving in the opposite direction?